adult densities can reach up to 700,000 uh, per meter squared. So they will uh, completely cover any heart service that they can attach to. And each one of these adults can actually filter up to a liter of water a day. So to put this into perspective for uh, everyone, if anyone's familiar with the uh, from Mille Lacs Lake or Lake Erie, these are very, very large uh, lake systems here in the United States, some of the largest that we have, and they can actually filter all of that water in one to three days' time. Uh, these zebra mussels are also very resilient to environmental stressors such as temperature. They can uh, they can survive in any temperature from zero degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Celsius. So they can overwinter here in South Dakota, which doesn't help uh, keep their populations in check. They also can uh, survive our hottest summer days. They also can uh, close their shells and avoid chemical treatment. So I always encourage people when they're trying to rid their boat of any AIS, that they use hot water and not chemical. This will help prevent any uh, pollution to our soils. And uh, this is also the most viable way of killing these, these mussels. So with them filtering the water, uh, this alters our food web because they're eating our zooplankton and our phytoplankton and they're defecating that or excreting that on our substrate in our lake and river systems. So this a lot of times can drastically reduce our phytoplankton and zooplankton po populations which can have a negative effect on several of our game species uh, but in few instances they can actually be beneficial to some of our uh, game species such as perch. With filtering the water it allows for more light penetration which allows for more macrophyte or aquatic vegetation growth and deeper uh, depths within a system and it can provide a refuge for some of our game fish. Some of those uh, species that they would compete with would be bluegill, uh, striped bass, or even our pelagic species such as herring which we have on the Missouri River system that a lot of our salmon and our walleyes eat. Uh, these, the added nutrients that is inevitably excreted in our substrate can have positive uh, correlations with uh, leeches and freshwater shrimp, which some of our game fish still eat, so it's not necessarily a negative there, but uh, it will affect our overall uh, species composition within a system. And as mentioned, uh, the increased clarity will uh, provide more vegetation, which can uh, cause tougher fishing for anglers, and it can also increase our water temperatures. And then over winter you have a higher possibility of winter kill because of that decom decomposition of that vegetation. For human impacts, these, these zebra mussels are very costly. Uh, there's upwards of over a million or a billion dollars in annual expenses to the United States alone for just treating uh, plants, uh, irrigation uh, systems, and then uh, just boat and dock maintenance. Several private entities have actually gotten on board to help with uh, decontamination of these uh, zebra mussels off of docking structures and boat structures uh, just because of how uh, widespread these are can become and most people just don't have uh, heated systems that they can use to decontaminate their systems. Once established, they're generally it's generally infeasible to treat these. Uh, there's been certain incidences where they've tried uh, chemically treating zebra mussels. For example, Christmas Lake in Minnesota, the DNR treated that system and that was just a 7,500 cubic foot area and that cost just under $7,000 to treat. The following year, uh, zebra mussels were established again in the system. So, although Zequinox and Earth Tech QZ, which are two chemicals that are used to treat these zebra mussels, are fairly effective, it, you've, you need very few zebra mussels in a system to reestablish. And with how um, how fecund these are and how quickly they can reestablish, it's not generally advised to try to treat them once they are established. In Lewis and Clark Reservoir, if we were to treat that system, it would cost us almost $24 billion 
uh, with how large that reservoir is and how expensive the, the chemicals are to, to treat those villager or to treat those zebra mussels. Another reason why these are so invasive is that they uh, have they can prefer one algae over another. So green algae, uh, a native algae that we have here in South Dakota, they can prefer and consume green algae and actually excrete or defecate uh, blue green algae without actually killing it. So this allows for blue green algae blooms to uh, become more pronounced and actually take over systems that zebra mussels are present in. And blue green algae actually can have negative effects on livestock and even your pets. Uh, it releases toxic chemicals and it can actually kill uh, those species. It also has a very small uh, foul uh, smell and zebra mussels overall uh, when they're filtering that water uh, can make the water smell a lot worse and once they die it can make your shorelines smell like rotten fish so no one no one wants that especially if you're a lake homeowner or if you're even recreating on uh, a system it, it can uh, really reduce your uh, your fun when you're in one of these systems the other uh, scary situation with these zebra mussels is that they're filtering this water on a daily basis and they can actually accumulate uh, and concentrate these heavy metals such as mercury uh, in their tissue. And then we have fish species that will consume these zebra mussels and then our game species will eat those uh, species such as round goby in the Great Lakes. Our smallmouth bass and walleyes will eat those round gobies and then we'll inevitably uh, consume those walleyes and we can actually have higher concentrations of mercury in the, in the fish flesh which makes them less healthy uh, to eat. And then uh, the shells overall, they're very sharp. And if you're not wearing aqua socks, they can actually cut up your feet. Or if you're trying to swim in a water body, they can cut up your legs and your feet when you're just trying to recreate in one of our uh, areas that have zebra mussels. All right, so as mentioned, the zebra mussels and quagga mussels are our two biggest culprits in the invertebrate family. We also have other invertebrates that we have here in the state that can also cause some issues and two of those being uh, rusty crayfish and red swamp crayfish. These get slightly larger than our native uh, counterparts. They can grow up to 11 centimeters or roughly five, five and a half inches in length. Uh, the rusty crayfish, one of their key uh, identifiers there would be that rusty spot along their abdomen. Our native species will not have that. And then you can also see the black band on the tip of their claws those are two uh, characteristics that you can look for when trying to identify the rusty crayfish. And then the red swamp crayfish, they look like a small lobster. Uh, they grow slightly larger at 12 centimeters, but they also have very rough uh, dew claws up front that will help you identify a red swamp crayfish versus uh, rusty or one of our native crayfish here in the state. Moving on, uh, Asian clam. We have those uh, on the Missouri River system down in Lake or uh, Lewis and Clark, and actually in uh, Angostura Reservoir out in western South Dakota. These do not have bissel threads, which is another way to help uh, help identify these. Uh, but they have biofouling characteristics, and uh, they will become very prevalent once established. Uh, Red rim melania, a uh, unique. Uh, characteristic of these is that they uh, can actually consume fish eggs. These are found in streams in western South Dakota and have a fairly unique uh, uh, characteristics to them as well with their cone-shaped shells. Uh, we do not have any other species similar to this in the state so they're fairly easily identifiable. New Zealand mud snails. If you are a hatchery manager uh, this is pretty much game over for you with them. It's, it's very costly to get rid of these and they're very small so it's hard to uh, find these unless you are actively sampling for them. This picture on the right, you can just see how small those are. That's a, a dime in the photo and uh, as you can see they're, they're only a couple centimeters long uh, and they can grow in densities of up to 300,000 per meter squared. They can outcompete a lot of our native species and they also have bio, bio following characteristics. 
All right, as mentioned before, uh, some of our other species that we have surrounding our state that have not uh, made their way over the border yet would be uh, snakeheads. These are a ferocious uh, invasive species that we have uh, in, most, in most of our eastern states. They can have a wide range of sizes depending on uh, the subspecies, uh, bullseye being uh, the largest, growing up to four feet in length, but our blotched snakehead uh, only grow up to 13 inches in length. They are native to Eastern and Southeast Asia, and they were introduced initially for as a food fish and an aquarium pet. But as most aquarium pets, people grow attached to them, and once they grow too large, they end up just dumping them into one of their local lakes or rivers, and that's how they spread to new water bodies. One of the unique characteristics of these is that they uh, have capabilities of breathing atmospheric oxygen. So it's very hard to get rid of these once they're present and they can survive in a lot of different situations with poor water quality. They even, uh, they even have been known to attack humans. Uh, anything that they can fit in their mouth, they're gonna try to eat. So this has negative consequences on a lot of our native species that are trying to reside in the same system. These will uh, outcompete and overtake a lot of the native species and even extirpate a lot of them from uh, the systems that they're prevalent in. Here's just a few photos of them. As you can see, they're very aesthetically pleasing and, and that's why they were aquarium pets initially. Uh, but overall, they are very detrimental and we do not want them coming into South Dakota. Moving on to a black carp. This looks very similar to uh, grass carp that we have in the state, but uh, these actually feed on mussels. Uh, but they feed on native mussels and invasive mussels, but they don't feed on invasive mussels enough to control their populations. These are primarily in, in large rivers, and that's where they like to spawn in, and that's one of the main reasons why we have prevented them coming into a lot of our systems in South Dakota Currently, they're mostly on the Mississippi River. I briefly mentioned Round Gobi before, uh, but they're in the Great Lakes. They actually feed on zebra mussels and actually use zebra mussels as spawning beds. Uh, but they also predate on smallmouth bass eggs. And there was actually even some seasonal closures on Lake Erie for fishing for smallmouth bass because of some of the declines they were seeing with uh, round gobies having a negative effect on their annual recruitment to the systems. White perch. This kind of looks like a yellow perch and a white bass uh, or just a juvenile white bass if you're not familiar uh, with the different characteristics of, uh, of a white perch. They are on our border here in Nebraska and Iowa, and one of the main reasons why they're so invasive is that they prey heavily on walleye and, and white bass eggs, and they can also hybridize with our native species. These actually cause a collapse, they believe, in the Bay of Quinte for their walleye population because of their food or their egg consumption of walleye. For a brief moment, we thought that we had an infestation of quagga mussels in western South Dakota and Angostura, but that came back as a false, false positive. So currently we do not have any quagga mussels in the state, but they are fairly well established in the Great Lakes and in the northeastern part of the United States and the southwest portion of the United States. They were also introduced at the same time as zebra mussels and uh, have some of the same characteristics as zebra mussels for filtering tendencies and uh, attaching to different surfaces. Starry stonewort, th this is very easily identifiable by uh, that starry growth that you can see on that picture on the far right. We have these in Minnesota and they are encroaching in on our northeastern lakes. So we would really like to prevent them from coming across the border as they also grow in very dense mats and make it very hard to swim or fish uh, in areas that they are established in. Another reason why they are so invasive is that they can be transported by uh, not only watercraft but also mammals and birds as well. Alright, spiny water flea. This is a pred predaceous zooplankton. They get their name, if you look at the photo on the far right, they have a large spine that grows off uh, the back end 
of their abdomen and it's not very palatable for our game fish that reside in the same system. And they also, also predate upon our native zooplankton that our game fish need uh, to survive their first uh, winter. They can also clog your fishing equipment. The photo on the far left shows a bunch of spiny water flea on fishing line. And a lot of places that have these established uh, actually encourage anglers to carry a fishing cloth with them. So when you're reeling in your line, you actually run that line through your cloth to try to pull off all those spiny water flea before bringing them in to your reel so you don't spread those when you're moving from one water body to the next. All right, that covers our invasive uh, species that we have in the state and surrounding our states. And now I'm gonna move on to some of the action items that South Dakota Game Fish and Parks is doing to help prevent uh, the future, future spread of these AIS species. Luckily, we've had some support in legislation with uh, adding some additional requirements for boaters to abide by to help prevent AIS. Uh, one being uh, prohibiting the movement or possession of AIS. A uh, large fine is associated with uh, carrying any AIS on board or any plant vegetation or mud. We also require boaters uh, to have all of their watercraft clean uh, after exiting a water body before launching into another water body. So you might wonder why mud is associated with this and not just plants and uh, other AIS. Well, I mentioned zebra, uh, New Zealand mud snails. Those are actually found in mud and uh, Asian clam and other invertebrate species can actually bury themselves in the mud and you might not notice that they are there until dumping that into a new system and they will eventually make their way into a new water body. We want to make sure that all of our drains are pulled as mentioned, villagers are free floating in water and they can be transported in our water. So we want to make sure our live well plugs are pulled, our drain plug on our actual watercraft is pulled, and we uh, remove all the water from our bilges and our ballast tanks. We also require uh, watercrafts to stop at an inspection station if they drive by one. These are very quick inspections. They should only take one to two minutes and up to five minutes if it's a high risk uh, inspection. But uh, all watercraft are required to stop and they actually can get pulled over by a conservation officer if they uh, fail to stop if we have a conservation officer present at our inspection station. We can actually also uh, detain that watercraft if there is AIS on board. In most situations we are able to decon that unit on site but if it is completely inundated with zebra mussels, we do not have the capabilities of deconning that at one of our roving uh, wood stations. So we'll actually bring that watercraft into one of our local regional offices and decontaminate that uh, at our office. It is a class two misdemeanor uh, to carry any AIS or vegetation on board. And if you are in violation twice in the same year, it will be a class one misdemeanor, which comes with a larger fine and potentially jail time, but in most situations it's just a larger fine. Another AIS regulation that we have is that uh, you cannot transport any invasive fish or aquatic bait in water obtained from a lake, river, or stream except while in the boat ramp parking area. So we made that last clause in there because there's actually several cleaning stations fish cleaning stations adjacent to our boat ramps in the same parking lot. So if you are an angler and you want to go clean your fish at that adjacent uh, fish cleaning station, you are allowed to do so. But if you have to leave the boat ramp parking area, you have to remove all water from your watercraft and all vegetation before uh, going to go clean those fish. All right, so here is our state AIS management plan. This is our statewide management plan, and it's a three-legged stool focusing on prevention, regulation, and control. So a big portion of your guys' job will be in regards to prevention and control. This is just educating our boaters and just providing that outreach to our, our watercraft users. We want to make sure that this is a very positive 
scenario that we are involving ourselves with and just helping our ed helping educate our boaters on what to do and what not to do when using our water bodies. And then for our uh, control methods, in certain instances we will eradicate a system of AIS. For example, if we find curly leaf uh, in its early establishment, we have been able to treat those in certain instances. And then also just monitoring for uh, these AIS species. And then for regulation, this is where our law enforcement comes into play. Our law enforcement is a huge help with prevention of AIS, and uh, they help with enforcing our regulations and making sure everyone's abide, abiding our laws. So a few things that we're doing for AIS control. Uh, that would be zebra mussel monitoring. We actually attach hesterdendy plate samplers on the bottom of some of our uh, docking structures to look for any early detections of zebra mussels. When we pull our docks out at the end of the year, we also uh, inspect those to see if there is any zebra mussels attached to the docks. This is just a very large structure that is uh, easily inspected at the end of the year and really helps us identify if there is any zebra mussels and undetected water bodies. And then on our volunteer side of things, we have a citizen monitoring program and we give out uh, PVC uh, dock samplers that volunteers can attach to their private docks and can pull them up throughout the summer to see if there's been any zebra mussels attached to those. And then at times we will also go out and do some villager sampling and we'll throw out a villager toe out of the water body and collect a small water sample and then look at that in the lab to see if we have any villagers in that sample. And then looking over at our big headed carp monitoring, there's been a large push uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to have a better understanding of where our invasive carp are at throughout the United States. So currently we have a few studies being conducted in South Dakota one looking at their movement so we've implanted transmitters in some of the abdomens of these invasive carp and are tracking their movements up and down uh, the big suit james and vermilion river and then we're also uh, coupling that with an edna study and doing water quality sampling and seeing if we can find any dna of these invasive carp in these three tributaries off the missouri river system currently it's looking great and we have not seen any expansion of, this, of the invasive carp above those barriers that mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation. And then for plant monitoring, we will uh, at times have curly leaf pondweed surveys. We did that on Pickerel Lake this last year and we also had a small treatment uh, on Pickerel Lake as well. Moving on to some extra prevention regulations. So, Boat ramp signs, you guys have already been able to help out with this. Uh, we put stencils in on some of our concreted uh, boat ramps for, and that says plug in or plug out to help remind watercraft users to pull your plugs when uh, leaving a water body. We actually also developed three new signs uh, for the state of South Dakota this year and most of those are already uh, placed out on our water bodies. First one being uh, pull all plugs and then an invasive species alert sign that has stickers associated with it and shows our recreators what invasive species we have in each individual system in the state. And then for our zebra mussel positive water bodies in eastern South Dakota, we have developed a four foot by eight foot sign that shows uh, recreators that we have zebra mussels in these waters and we created such a large sign to make it pop out to everyone and so everyone can see that and know going into, their, into that water body what they're dealing with. A few other things uh, that our recreators can use to find more information on our, our AIS regulations and species present in the, in the state would be in our fishing handbook or on South Dakota leastwanted.sd.gov. You can look at photos, regulations, and what we're doing in the state in regards to AIS in these uh, different forms of education. And that 
concludes our uh, biology portion of our training today. We'll now move on to uh, looking at decontamination.